now my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker to discuss the critical need of developing a workforce that is skilled in cybersecurity and related fields as a foundation for achieving security objectives. Rodney Peterson is the director of the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, also known as NICE, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, uh, in the U.S. Department of Commerce. Previously, he founded and directed the EDUCAUSE Cybersecurity Initiative and was the lead staff liaison for the Higher Education Information Security Council. And he is the co-editor of a book entitled Computer and Network Security in Higher Education. Please join me in welcoming Rodney Peterson to the stage. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. And after hearing the Senator's remarks, it reminds me I just spent the weekend in North Carolina for my daughter's graduation where I just perfected Southern accents, and now I have to perfect the Boston accent of how a cop is pronounced. So uh, I'll try to present to you uh, uh, not only a D.C. accent, but a Midwestern accent because my roots go back to the state of Michigan where I was born and raised. I just wanted to first kind of reflect on one of the comments made, which many of you are familiar with, with respect to cybersecurity risk. Because we think about cybersecurity risk primarily in the context of bad actors or threats or vulnerability which might be flaws in designs of systems, operating systems, and software. Um, but we don't often think about the vulnerabilities that people present, whether they're an employee, whether they're a consumer, or whether they're a professional whose job is to make our cybersecurity or our cyber systems secure. And that's really the crux of what NICE, the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, is about, is making sure we have a workforce uh, that is knowledgeable and skilled in order to enable a digital economy. And that skilled workforce, as I said, is really everyone in the workforce. Cybersecurity is everyone's responsibility, but we're gonna have a particular set of individuals for whom cybersecurity is their job, it's their work role, it's their profession, it's their career. And so the way NICE uh, goes about this is by working together both across the federal and state government as kind of an interagency organization, as well as with academia and the private sector. And I don't really want to talk in great detail about NICE per se today, but I'm happy to answer questions and talk to you about some of the various initiatives and activities we have going on. But in the spirit of your gathering here today and launching Cyber, Cyber Mass, uh, I wanted to just share with you three thoughts about kind of a key recipe or ingredients for cybersecurity education training and workforce that I think you can take forward both from here today and I suspect you're already working on it. And the first of which is this notion of community, which is Phil Bond said is really what Cyber USA is about, a community of communities. And I understand that many of you are probably from the business community, but it takes geographic areas to not only be working with your business colleagues, but across responsibilities across your organizations, even across your sectors. So from a cybersecurity workforce perspective, we put first and foremost employers. And employers could be the federal government, it could be state government, but it could be a private sector company. It could be a IT company, it could be a retail company, it could be a school system. But the reality is, most organizations in this day and age need a cybersecurity workforce. It may range from one or two to hundreds, but employers need to be driving this initiative because they should be defining the requirements for that workforce of the future. Closely behind that, however, are what I call learners. And learners could be students, they could be job seekers, or quite frankly, somebody already in the workforce. Because this notion of learning happening in high school or in college and then it stops is not the way cybersecurity is gonna evolve in the future. It's a continuous learning activity and we need to focus on those learners from students to full-time employees to make sure that they're continuously building and honing their skills in a way that's gonna best serve the employers that as I said at the outset are driving this. A third community ingredient, however, is economic development organizations. Because cybersecurity is in high demand, as we know from the work we do and some of the data we have, but many communities aspire to attract more business, attract more opportunity, to attract more diverse sectors there. And as you think about the workforce of the future in Boston or Massachusetts, Massachusetts in particular, you may want to think about what are the opportunities there and bring in those economic opportunity professionals and organizations. 
And of course, part of that community ingredient is education providers. And not only universities, as quite frankly, NICE started with and works with most closely uh, through our Centers of Academic Excellence program, universities that either have cybersecurity degrees or interdisciplinary programs or certificates or training, but community colleges have become really important to us in the past couple of years as a way of bringing more people into the fold as a stepping stone, if you will, to a university degree. And quite frankly, a lot of community college students and graduates come away with more hands-on skill than a university student who's heard a lot of book knowledge over their four years in the classroom. And then certainly driving down deeper into our K through 12 school systems, high schools, middle schools, elementary schools. Cybersecurity as a career is not something that I suspect most of us in the room ever heard about or learned about when we were in elementary school. We saw teachers, we saw firemen, we saw lawyers, we saw a lot of examples of careers and things we might want to do. But career awareness at the elementary age level is increasingly important. And that's another opportunity for business leaders, community leaders, to get more active in your schools so that they can see those visible examples and role models they might want to uh, aspire to be like. Another ingredient in the community are training and certification providers. Because despite efforts of colleges and universities or other formal educational programs to provide knowledge and some skills, a lot of that technical training, hands-on training, happens in an environment that's different from what an academic instit institution can offer. Now clearly we need to move academic institutions more towards that hands-on learning, but training and certifications, industry-recognized certifications, are an increasingly important part of the credentials that a skilled workforce brings to bear. And then, as I said earlier, the government, whether it's the federal government, state, local, tribal territories, are also important players to involve, not only because of their workforce needs, but the ways that they can support through public policy, through funding, through other types of leadership to make this community ingredient work together. And then finally, and not least, are associations such as Technology Council, such as Mass TLC, because bringing together not only the business leaders in technology, but trying to take that ecosystem across education, across training, across economic development and all the rest, and making that work together seamlessly is really important. The, the mission of NICE is to promote and energize an integrated ecosystem of education, training, and workforce development. And the reason I wanted to start with community, it's not enough for you to talk in your own circles about this. Within your community, you need to engage those stakeholders, support them, identify ones that aren't at the table to make sure you have this continuous pipeline and this kind of holistic approach to cybersecurity workforce. So my recipe starts with community, but secondly, it then starts also with consistency. And by consistency, I don't mean a cookie cutter approach where everything has to be the same and there's no room for variety, but this is where NIST and the role that NICE plays kind of steps in through standards, through standardization. And I don't know if you're aware, but one of the things NICE is best known for is the NICE Cybersecurity Workforce Framework. That framework provides a taxonomy, a reference source, a common way to think about cybersecurity work. And it's not just a narrow technical role that we think of that some IT people play, but it's seven broad categories of work where somebody like myself who worked for 13 years for a CIO at the University of Maryland as his director of policy and planning, and my path was via business school, via law school, jobs that prepared me for a policy role. And so one of our seven categories talks about oversight and governance. But certainly there's a role for people who operate and maintain and run our systems and need to be security engineers and security analysts and other specific types of roles. And so this nice framework not only gives us a way to think about the workforce with seven categories, 31 specialty areas, but drills down into knowledge, skills, and abilities that are required to accomplish those tasks. The reason that is so important is that not only does that give us a framework to point to, it gives employers, talking about that earlier, a way to decide how they're gonna develop their workforce, what kind of workforce do they need, what 
types of positions do they need to knit together? What does that job description or announcement look like? What are the tasks that are going to be required or the duties? And what are the qualifications or requirement? All that type of information is in the NICE framework, and we want to drive employers for consistency purposes to start using it so that job seekers can start to compare one job against the other. And it's not just a comparison of salary, but now we start to see position descriptions and announcements that sound very similar. It goes further though in terms of consistency. We want our universities and our community colleges and our high schools and our training providers providing training programs that are aligned to this framework. And so we've begun to use this NICE cybersecurity workforce framework to help our centers of academic excellence in cybersecurity, which covers research universities, four-year institutions, community colleges, to have knowledge units that are aligned to the framework and as part of the criteria for being designated by the Department of Homeland Security or the National Security Agency, you have to meet the criteria, including the alignment to the framework. And so students as well as employers can begin to get exposed to more consistent program of education. We also need to have consistent discussion about workforce demand and supply. And part of that comes from the data that we analyze and we collect or we quite frankly speculate about. And so one of the ways we've done that with NICE is to fund CompTIA and Burning Glass to develop a tool called CyberSeek. CyberSeek.org is a website that has an interactive jobs meet heat map that can show you that there are 348,000 jobs in cybersecurity based on job announcements and postings, not based on speculation of what the future demand might be, not based on what people would like to have if they had an unlimited source of budget, but these are the actual job announcements posted, as well as jobs that aren't announced and posted but are part of the workforce. And you can go to that interactive map and look at the national demand. You can look at states such as Massachusetts. You can even drill down into metropolitan areas and look at what the job demand is in Boston. And it's not just the numbers, but it's what you learn about those jobs. You learn about the jobs that are available according to what? The NICE Cybersecurity Workforce Framework. Because we want job seekers to know if that's the job market and where I want to go, then there's this corresponding list of knowledge, skills, abilities I need to obtain to get there. And so we think that's a very helpful tool to get us consistently talking about workforce demand. But then the other side of it is where's the supply coming from? And so you'll see the beginnings of some data there, starting with certifications because CompTIA and some of their peers are able to provide those individuals with certifications, some of the major industry recognized certifications. So you see not only the demand, but the supply side and we can begin to more consistently talk about that equation. Another nice feature of the CyberSeek tool is that it has a career pathways portal. And so let's say you are in an entry level position, but you want to look at how I can advance to a mid-level career. Maybe you start or in a security analyst role and you want to become a penetration tester. And that's not always a straight line from one to the next. But the tool shows you not only what the increase in earnings might be, but what the pathway is for getting there. What additional knowledge, skills, abilities do I need? What type of academic training or training or certifications might help me advance my career? So the ability to talk about uh, job supply and demand is important. And then the final thing is with respect to credentials. So for those of you that do hire cybersecurity employees, I suspect that three of the most prominent things people look at are resumes that include academic credentials, academic degrees, secondly, maybe industry recognized certifications and experience. And yet we know a lot of that information is pretty arbitrary. It's not necessarily based on performance-based assessments and it's very difficult to really prove the quality of some of those credentials that people bring. So there's a lot of efforts we're involved in, both formal efforts as well as foundation efforts to increase the quality of credentials so that we can more consistently evaluate, prepare, and develop those employees of the future. So again, your community working together and moving towards consistency. And then the final ingredient that we think is important is the focus on content. Because as I said earlier, it's really about learning, and it, whether it's about a student in elementary school, a college student, or an employee that's on the job, 
we need to make sure that they have content that really contributes to their ongoing learning. And even the content breaks down in three different ways. So first I want to talk briefly about substance, secondly delivery, and then third is the issue of assessment. So when we talk about substance, I would admit that I think we're still a long way away from defining what a cybersecurity curriculum or cybersecurity knowledge unit really should be in the future. We have a range in universities from degree programs where you can get a degree or an academic degree in cybersecurity to where it's very interdisciplinary and whether it's courses or integrated in courses, it's kind of a continuum. And again, in the context of variety, that's okay but we need more consistency, the ability to deliver curriculum that's standards-based that can easily be replicated and followed by others. And this is not easy to do. That may sound like a no-brainer, but particularly when you think about universities where much of the curriculum and the courses that are taught in the United States are not learner-centered. They're not centered on the learner or the job seeker or what the employer needs. They're centered around the teacher, the faculty member what their expertise is, what their research is, their individual creation, their, their way to approach knowledge. And again, not that that creativity and innovation is not necessary, but there's very little of sharing in the interest of the threat sharing network that you're talking about. There's very little sharing of curriculum and course content across universities with the exception of a few initiatives that are relatively new, including what the Centers of Academic Excellence are doing. The National Security Agency has a curriculum building exercise. And even within the academic disciplines, ACM and IEEE have started to develop curricular guidance on cybersecurity. So that substance will be really important as we move into the future. And going back to the role of business or employers, you need to be informing that not necessarily academics who maybe rarely touched a computer or administered a system or done cybersecurity work in their life. We need employers who maybe are guest lecturers, who are adjunct faculty, who are advising the institution and how to do it. We need a very robust way that businesses interact with our academic institutions to influence that substance. So secondly, let's think about delivery. So traditional delivery in most schools and most universities is classroom and it's typically lecture and now we're seeing the advent of more online and distance learning and opportunities there but there are many other ways to deliver instruction or deliver learning which could include quote unquote on the job training whether it's after you hire somebody and they need some additional uh, training or mentoring or it could be the internship that a student takes during their course of study it could also be the notion of a cybersecurity apprenticeship where somebody could actually bypass a college or university and go directly to the employer where they earn as they learn, where they're getting on-the-job experience and then supplementing that with academic courses and curriculum that allows them to expand their education. I think we need to think creatively and differently about how we deliver that instruction. And the final piece, which kind of pulls both delivery and assessment together, is how we assess learning, how we assess somebody's knowledge and skills. Because in academia, as you know, a lot of that is exams, it's papers, it's things that are fairly arbitrary with respect to somebody's ability to do the work you might need them to do. Even our training and certifications, a lot of the certifications are exams that are multiple choices or uh, true false but the kind of questions that don't allow somebody to demonstrate their skills so we need delivery mechanisms that provide more hands-on learning more technical learning as well as the ability to assess somebody's skills and so as another small example of how we're trying to do that with nice we have funded a project called the nice challenge project which takes the nice workforce framework i talked about earlier particularly the tasks the things that need to get accomplished by a cybersecurity worker, build a virtual environment where students or employees can go in and demonstrate or even learn how to do tasks that their employers are gonna need. It's being used by faculty to supplement classroom learning. It's being used by supervisors and organizations to help better understand what their employees' development needs are. But we have more and more needs, and certainly training and certification companies are moving more towards this performance-based assessment as a way of both assessing learning as well as making the delivery mechanism more interact interactive. 
two more quick final examples about content. And again, it kind of crosses both substance as well as delivery. So competitions, cybersecurity competitions are a growing way that students engage quite often in a co-curricular way outside of the classroom, usually not for credit, as a way to learn cybersecurity skills and knowledge, and also to demonstrate it as a team to compete against other teams. And most importantly, an opportunity for businesses and employers to observe students that they may want to hire in the future and we're seeing these competitions which you know really primarily happen at the university level move down to the high school level even the middle school level and now we're seeing professionals and companies and organizations competing much like athletes compete over the course of their lifetime in cybersecurity competitions which is a great way to expose them to content for them to demonstrate their skills and for supervisors and others to observe <coughs> what they're actually learning and provide additional assistance. So the final thing I want to say with respect to content is the role of mentoring. And, and mentoring gets talked about a lot in general in the workplace and a lot with respect to cybersecurity. But it's true that we not only need mentoring for young professionals coming into the workplace who need to learn about workplace culture or workforce expectations, maybe some on-the-job training and skills development that they can get. But we also need mentoring for underserved populations, and populations who quite frankly are not getting the support and assistance through our kind of traditional school systems. And so I really encourage all of you, I challenge all of you to look for people who are not in the cybersecurity workforce, the IT workforce. When we think about that demand and how we close that gap in the demand, you know, there aren't enough women, there aren't enough minorities, there aren't enough individuals from underserved populations, and there aren't enough people who maybe want to change careers in the mid-career ages because cybersecurity is a good opportunity for them. And one of the ways that that can happen is through individuals making a difference in their life, whether it's volunteering your time, reaching out to them through community organizations, going into the schools, working with school administrators to really make a difference in those individuals' lives. So I really encourage you to think about, you know, is there somebody you can either mentor in your workplace, somebody in the local school system you can mentor, and especially somebody in one of those underrepresented groups that you can reach out to. So again, my ingredient for you here in Boston and Massachusetts and really making a difference in cybersecurity workforce is bringing your community together and not just your business community, which as I say is probably the first and foremost important piece. I talk to a lot of academic audiences where it's predominantly academics who aren't reaching back to their businesses and their employers, but think about all the other players that need to be at the table, the economic development organization, state and local government. Secondly, to make sure you're looking for ways to be consistent. Doesn't mean that there couldn't be some variety and some experimentation, but standardizing our effort as much as possible will allow us to make progress much more quickly. And then finally, we need to really hone in on the content. What is the curriculum? What are the delivery mechanisms? And how do we assess performance? I think if you put those three key ingredients together, your community will go a long way towards addressing both your local workforce needs, your state workforce needs, and quite frankly, the nation's workforce needs. So thank you so much, and enjoy being with you here today.